I started my first journeys in Southeast Asia in 1999 with two old friends of mine from Tipperary, Johnny Morrissey and Liam Boyle. And we went to Vietnam and we, we rambled around there from north to south and had a great time. And we went through Bangkok on the way there and on the way home and didn't spend more than a few days there. But I was fascinated by the city as just about everybody is who comes here. Uh, the beauty of it, the multicultural nature of it, uh, the Buddhist, deeply rooted Buddhist culture, which tends to inform most of the things that happen here and certainly the way that people are. And I knew I wanted to come back and I did the following year. Um, I knew it was a place I wanted to spend some time in and find things to do, but I also knew that uh, without some kind of an Irish music scene that it would be difficult for me to engage fully with the place. So I saw an Irish pub called the Dubliner as I was walking around one day and I went in and there was Irish music of a sort going on, it was mostly rock music. There was a, a Japanese fiddler, a man called Tetz, who was playing the fiddle very flamboyantly and jumping up and down on one leg and really having a go at Charlie Daniels specials. And when there was a break, I went to him and said, look, uh, are there any Irish musicians here in this town, people I'd like to meet? He said, there are. And I said, could you arrange that I meet them? He said, I can. So we exchanged telephone numbers and I got a call from him saying that we're going to meet two Irish musicians uh, the following Sunday uh, and at the British club. I'd never been to a British club in my life. Uh, so, uh, so we did. Um, and uh, the British club is a venerable institution formed in 1903. And instead of me talking about the British club, why don't I bring you there? We're off by taxi now across Bangkok's COVID-free but quiet streets to that famous club. I'm visiting the club now again with Frank Crocker, one of the two musicians I first met there. Frank and the great Ellen Piper John Murphy were my first contact with Irish traditional music in Bangkok. Right. And what was an Irish music session doing here in the British Dub? This is where I first met you and first met John so many years ago, 21 years ago. Well, the, pipe, the Scottish pipers bring their screamers here in practice and they play here regularly, especially for weddings and things like that. Yeah. So we got the Scottish pipes. We have lads that play traditional Irish music, yeah. here, as you know. Um, and we have Welsh people that occasionally come and give us concerts on the lawn, especially around Christmas time, with their Welsh harps and what have you. Yeah. So it's it's you know it's sort of representative of the, the the character of the people in the club. We have a lot of Irish here. After I returned uh, to to Bangkok and many successive years and got to know the city better, I started to hang out with with John a lot, and we became very very close friends. We played music a lot uh, where he lived. Uh, and we'd sometimes play till the small hours of the night, just as I did with people back in Ireland and anywhere in America. We only made one set of recordings ever together, and that was the occasion of Frank Crocker's birthday. We decided to present him with a little CD. So John and myself went into the studio and we put on the pipes and the banjo and I added the guitar. And we did it in an afternoon and we gave the, the CD we made to Frank and that was the end of it. meticulous man, very well ordered man, always very, very well presented and uh, and very nice to people, a very quirky sense of humour and, uh, you know, a very witty man, but never unkind to people. We started to play in local pubs like the Warsteiner Steuben, can't get my head around that one, and we played there every Wednesday, um, mostly to thunderous indifference, but we didn't care. Uh, we were having fun ourselves. But the most moving experience I think I ever had in my life uh, was when Father Joe Meyer, the director of the Mercy Centre, which is a home for street kids, or, um, many of them without parents, lost children, have fallen between all the cracks in society. Uh, many of them uh, born uh, at that time with HIV AIDS uh, and their parents gone, of course. 
uh, a home for over 350 kids. He invited us to do some musical presentations there and he asked us one, one day, would you go to the, the ward where the kids are trying to go to sleep? Uh, and uh, there was one particular ward which is devoted entirely to young children with HIV. And he said, play music for them, make them feel a little better. There was coughing and spluttering. And I'll never forget going in there with the kind of heavy air of the tropics and the fans whirring uh, and, uh, and the windows open with mosquito nets there and the children tossing and turning uh, in the heat and, and coughing. Uh, these were sick children. Uh, the meds were good and many of them survived, but uh, they were very sick at that time. And we started to play music and walk around. And I played the mandolin and John played the low whistle. And magic happened. Within 15 minutes, they were all asleep. And we came back time after time again, and the same thing happened all the time. And I, I don't think uh, I, I'll ever be more conscious of the power of music to transcend situations and those experiences, and we did them for a long time. Um, John, of course, was quirky about it. He says, Maloney, he says, we've graduated from driving people out the door to putting them to sleep. But anyway, we played, we played a lot and uh, we, we traveled together. Uh, we went to Burma, Myanmar and played there uh, in villages, uh, brought the pipes and the banjo there uh, and did cultural exchanges, all very, very informal at a time when it wasn't even legal to do a butcher, what the hell. Um, and we also then went to Vietnam, uh, once to, to, to Ho Chi Minh City to give workshops to uh, people who were playing in the symphony. Uh, but wanted to play and earn some money in Irish pubs. And there was a very colourful Irish pub there at the time, Sheridan's Pub, run by a man called Mike Forsyth. But then um, Peter Yarrow contacted me, Peter, uh, Paul and Mary Yarrow, and had planned to do a tour in Vietnam, a kind of an atonement tour, uh, because of all their opposition to the Vietnam War. Put his money where his mouth is, in other words. And myself and John accompanied him on a nationwide tour which was focused on the effects of long-term warfare, Agent Orange and exploded ordinances, and the horrible damage done, environmental damage done by major war. And we did that, and it was an extraordinary experience, meeting people that we never would have met otherwise, all the way from Ho Chi Minh City to Da Nang, to Hoi An, to Hue, and eventually uh, ending up in the, in the Hanoi Opera House in the capital of the country. And, and John and myself became, a tour like that will really, it, it will create great bonding between you. Any musicians will know that, that that happens under those circumstances. He worked in a variety of jobs. He was a HR person. He started off at the London Underground, uh, worked in personnel, always in human relations, worked at oral laboratories in Ireland, Gillette in Canada, then Gillette in Singapore, then back to Ireland, then back again to Singapore. And I met him, in fact, just after he'd left Singapore and kind of semi-retired, came to Bangkok here. And uh, at that point, he started to, to study, uh, to, to read and write uh, and, uh, and speak Thai. And by the time I met him, he was fluent. He was a really smart man and very dedicated to any job he did, he did it with great perfection. In the last decade of his, well, seven years actually, of his working life, HR, uh, he was a senior HR person in the Pandora company, which was a multinational, but he turned it into a mega multinational. And he was enormously successful in his job. Started to play music less and less, and I saw less and less of him. And then, uh, just as he was about to retire at the age of 56, a disease kicked in. It was in his family, uh, but had lain latent, and it was incurable. It was a heart-related disease, and uh, tragically, over a nine-month period, just when he was about to retire, uh, he succumbed to it. Exactly the same disease, Martin McGuinness, the great Irish nationalist, uh, died from as well. And John passed away, and uh, I, I miss him most of the time. Uh, I think about music, and that's just about every day. Here's one of his sets of pipes that he left. Um, I have two of them here in a box uh, that remain to be distributed. And third set, um, I was able to, to, uh, to donate uh, to uh, a piper, wonderful piper, Rosalia, in Cuba. The only woman piper in Cuba, it seemed that I would think John would have, have really approved of that. And these other sets of pipes, there's two of them here. This is only, this is one of them. Um, I, I've left up to Louise Mulcahy, 
to determine where they go. And in fact, the tribute, the musical tribute to John today is going to be done by Louise Mulcahy, one of the great pipers in Irish music. I've known Louise since she was very young. She's conducting an extraordinary pioneering um, study of and, uh, and, and history of and publication of and film about and book about women pipers in Ireland. And women pipers have generally been ignored in what generally considered to be a male tradition. And she's remedying that gap. She's a brilliant young piper herself. And what she's going to do is play a slow air, a lament. Uh, it's, it's traditional for pipers. Pipers at my own mother's uh, graves, graveside, Eugene Lamb, the piper, played Tom Shinnacolla, I'm asleep and don't waken me. One of the most beautiful and powerful, powerful tunes you could ever play at any time, but especially at a funeral. And then uh, Louise and, and her sister, Michelle, the great multi-instrumentalist, and myself, we're going to play a tune that John and I played all the time here, just about every session. We were obsessed with it. It's a great old jig called The Humours of Bally Lachlan. Uh, and we're going, we're going to, we're going to hammer into that, and 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 and, and uh, we're going to give it, try to do John Murphy's memory justice. Uh, we'll see you down the road, John. Hopefully, in some form or other. And uh, I'll hand over right now to Louise Mulcahy, and then she'll be joined by Michelle Mulcahy and myself. Tribute to John Murphy.